Good morning. This is Brother Chad Long from Delhi Baptist Church, and <laughs> I uh, I get really I don't want to keep making excuses, but I have had a lot of computer issues. I, I think I get something fixed, then I encounter something else. Maybe I'm just going to have to get a new computer at some point, but um, I'll, I'll keep doing this um, as long as I feel like it's the devil against me and not the Lord. I. <laughs> If, if the Lord's not in this, I don't want to do it anyway. But the devil's giving me a hard time, and he has the power of the air as long as the Lord allows it. If the devil's one giving me a hard time, he's just going to embolden me. I'm not going to quit. So I do hope somebody's getting something out of these. Um, you never really know because it may be years, honestly, before people stumble across, uh, across your YouTube page or, or whatever. But I do hope people get... Uh, get something out of these and, and I hope they'll in, in, enjoy studying the Bible and, and having someone go through it with them and help them to understand it. Um, we are in a new place this morning. Um, this was supposed to be yesterday's but that's okay. We'll do it today. Um, but we're studying uh, the letter to uh, well the first letter Peter wrote. Uh, please understand a couple of things about Peter. First of all um, he was illiterate. Um, originally, when uh, when the Lord called him to be a disciple, I don't think he, he could read and write, and if he could, he couldn't read and write much. And when you say that, you have to be careful because there was more than one language. Um, it's, it's not like us growing up in America. We grow up um, and English is all we're taught. Unless you desire to learn another language you're not really taught it i mean i took some spanish i, I can read and write in spanish i can speak some of it and uh, i understand some of it but i i pursued that and i'm not fluent by any stretch i won't be writing letters in spanish you know um, the best i can do is a sentence and i can i can do that <laughs> but i won't be writing books in spanish english is my primary language well when peter was growing up they spoke Aramaic primarily. That was uh, something they picked up while in captivity by the Persians. Um, well, the Babylonians and then the Persians. They spoke Koine Greek, which was a common language between multi-nations. And they spoke some Hebrew. Um, Hebrew was their mother tongue, but it was not widely used. It was something you would use in the synagogue, maybe even use at home, but... Uh, but th they had those three languages circulating as they're growing up, and Greek was growing in popularity because they're under Roman rule, and the Romans uh, could speak Greek. Um, not to mention, the Romans had their own language. So there was there were several languages being spoken. So when you say someone was illiterate, it was they were illiterate by their standards. He may have been able to read and write in one of those languages, but not in something that would be widely circulated. So I said that to say this. Early in Peter's life, uh, he wasn't known for his writing skills. He was a fisherman, and then he was a disciple. So I believe the uh, it's very likely that we don't we can't prove this, but it's very likely Peter learned to read and write either directly from John Mark or from people that John Mark knew, because John Mark was younger than Peter, and John Mark was from an educated family that had some money. I believe the book, the gospel written by John Mark, was probably um, dictated by Peter. I think, uh, honestly, uh, while, while we believe the Holy Spirit wrote all of these, I think John Mark was just penning what Peter told him. I think Peter was his primary source, just like a journalist today. If a journalist is quoting someone today, they may be the one writing the article, but they're writing what's said by someone else. So I, I honestly think that the Gospel of Mark is actually the Gospel of Peter penned by Mark. Well, somewhere over the years, as Peter becomes an older man, he learns how to write. Either that, and this is possible too, or he just waxed eloquent in his older age and hired him somebody to write. Very likely, very possible, he didn't actually pen it, but he hired somebody who was educated to write it for him as he spoke. So either way, it's his letter. He dictated it. Their thoughts, um, his thoughts as far as uh, he's the mouthpiece, but uh, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. So we need to understand all of the Bible is the Holy Spirit 
It is all uh, God's word. But these men are involved. God used these men. Men that were, were uh, they're saved and they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's undeniable. Peter especially. So uh, without further ado, we'll look at the letter and uh, the first five verses of it. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't think anybody doubts that. We, we know he's an apostle. <clears throat> to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. It's funny how he worded that. I, I think that what this means is that he was writing to the believers that had been scattered because of persecution. Strangers, because becoming a Christian made you a stranger. Now you could argue back and say, well, how do you know he's not writing to lost people? I, I really don't think any of these writers were writing to lost people. They wouldn't have received it well. Um, I, I'm not writing letters to lost people because I don't think they'd understand what I'm writing. If anything, I'm giving them a gospel tract and hoping that they'll read it. But I'm not writing any letters to lost people. I believe this is written to believers who had been scattered by the persecution of the Roman Empire and by people who hated uh, God and, and uh, wanted to dispel the notion that Jesus is who he is. So that would make you a stranger. These areas he mentions, I won't get into geography, but Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all with the exception of Bithynia, are places we know that the Apostle Paul spread the gospel. Now, I believe the gospel spread to Bithynia, but Paul was uh, restricted from going there by the Holy Spirit, so he didn't go there, at least not in his first two missionary journeys. Um, if he went, he went way later, and we don't know about it. But there were plenty of other people that were carrying the gospel and that may be why the Holy Spirit forbade Paul in Acts chapter 16 because it may have been that he had someone else in mind for that region not that they weren't supposed to receive the gospel but the point is Peter is writing to these so when, when you write a letter you typically address it to someone he's addressing these I believe believers who are scattered and trying to comfort them now evidence for this view is verse 2 when he says elect. Elect always means save people. So while he calls them strangers in verse 1, in verse 2 he calls them the elect. He says elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Meaning God elected them because he knew how they'd choose. There's been a whole lot of argument about election. And, uh, and I don't mean the general election in America. I'm talking about uh, what we call the elect saved people been a lot of election or uh, election I've been a lot of uh, dispute over the word because of dispute over predestination and it's really quite simple um, and there's other verses to confirm this but just understand me okay people who claim that we're predestinated to make the decision for Christ or not and we have no choice in the matter are misunderstanding predestination Absolutely, we have a choice, just as Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden. I'm a whosoever will man. I believe that, you know, the Bible teaches that whosoever will may come. In fact, there's a whole song about that. But the fact that God knew how we'd choose is how we can call that predestination. I don't believe the Lord predetermined what we can and, will and cannot do. I believe he predetermined what we will do, meaning... He bases his decisions off what he knows is going to happen, not off what he thinks. Um, God can see all things forward and backward through time, so it doesn't infringe upon our ability to choose. It just means he knows how we'll choose. And the Bible supports that opinion because in, uh, in Romans, I think in chapter 8, Paul says that uh, the foreknowledge for whom he did foreknow, him also did he predestinate. And that just means he knew about it. If he knew about it, he can plan around it. That's pretty simple stuff. But I have to clarify the position because many people don't understand that. So if you have any trouble with that, uh, study more into it. Don't take my word. But anyway, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. We see foreknowledge here again, and that's what it means. Because of what he knew, he can elect those that he knows are going to choose him. Doesn't mean they didn't have a choice. Just means he based his, his choices on their choices. 
that he knew would happen. So anyway, <clears throat> through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that's a whole lot of words. It basically means that we're sanctified by the Spirit. When we get saved, the Spirit comes and lives in us, sanctifies us, seals us under the day of redemption, and then walks with us and helps us to make good decisions. Now, there's a difference between our soul, which is now saved at that point, and our flesh, which continues to sin. Now, the, the, the Spirit's got two main jobs. And just understand this. The Spirit of God is a he, not an it. He has two main jobs. When you get saved, he comes and lives within you. He seals your soul. He seals it. It's done. You're saved. You can't lose that. But he also guides our flesh, which is not saved. Please understand me. Your flesh is not saved. Your flesh cannot be saved. Your flesh will not go to heaven. Um, our flesh is doomed to die. And it is doomed to go to the grave. When the Lord does use it, he'll use it to reform it. But the way it sits now will not see heaven. So the Holy Spirit guides us and helps us to try to live a better life and do better things. But he only seals our soul, not our flesh. So anyway, I, I, I don't want to get deep into that because he mentions it in passing. This is something known, and so he doesn't linger on it. He's just using, he's just, this is basically by way of introduction. He's just saying who I wrote this to, the elect, to those who know these things, who are sanctified by the Spirit, unto obedience, and the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Now, now he starts his letter. All that was introduction. Grace unto you. Peace be multiplied. Grace has already been extended to them by God, but now Peter's offering his own. Grace unto you. Um, I'm extending it. May God extend more of it to you. Peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now this is just a reminder of where we find our hope, and our hope is in Jesus Christ, and in his resurrection, had he not resurrected, neither could we. So our hope in heaven is founded upon the fact that Christ is there, who lived the life like we're living, whose flesh had to be transfigured to go. And he didn't even sin. He could have went up like he was. But because this flesh was, well, <clears throat> it is imperfect. I mean, it's... It, it just is. It ages. It, it, uh, the, the, the point is, his, Jesus, who committed no sin, couldn't even take his flesh the way it was. So there's no hope that we can. Our hope, though, is in the fact that he resurrected, and he's transfigured, and he's, uh, he's in his new glorified body. He left the holes for identification, but he's not in the exact same body he was in here. That's why when he, uh, when he, resurrected there was some that, that didn't recognize him right away well but he left the holes anyway our lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and the fate not away reserved in heaven for you this is the promise we're given and this is the hope we have and I'll close with verse 5 which says who are kept by the power of God please please never forget our salvation is not kept by our power. Our salvation is kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Our faith is what permits us to be saved, but the power of salvation is kept by God, not by you and not by me. Now that's pretty clear, and I wish more people understood that. That's all the time we have for this morning. Um, I pray that you're able to read these things and understand them for yourselves. And I hope I didn't make it too hard to understand. I hope I made it clear enough. But do study these things and uh, take them throughout your day with you. Let them make a difference in your life and may God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.